Hey everyone, how you doing? So today we are going to be discussing um, week six um, for the African struggles for independence. Um, and so this is going to be a, um, uh, a discussion kind of composing general, uh, you know, uh, history of the continent of Africa with a few different case studies from the year 1500 approximately uh, with the advent of, let's say, the mixing of Portuguese uh, settlers right along the uh, west uh, coast of Africa introducing the idea and concept of slavery or uh, institutionalized slavery um, and then kind of migrating our way throughout the history uh, viewing a couple case studies here and there with colonization um, some of the differences between those you know specific case studies that we're going to have uh, and then progress into uh, post-colonial uh, times to kind of see what some of those uh, dynamics were going to be against the uh, sort of European imperialistic powers. And then have a discussion of uh, a short discussion on modern Africa, right? The 21st century, some challenges that they are having, some successes that they are also having, um, and then kind of wrap it up from there. So. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the lecture um, and sit back, relax, um, and we can uh, start. So some topics for us to consider today. Uh, we're going to be looking through the, sca uh, the scramble for Africa, uh, talking about what, it, what was it, uh, why is it important, how the European powers came together um, in order to finally kind of decide for themselves that they want to uh, uh, you know, essentially carve up Africa, right? Uh, and gobble, gobble all of it up for themselves as far as resource extraction and, you know, expanding their holdings. Uh, we're going to be uh, reviewing the Berlin Conference, how that comes into play. Uh, for the second half, getting into more of post-colonial Africa. What does that mean? Uh, how a lot of these territories that were once under the uh, influence and guise and uh, occupation, right, of foreign powers, how they ended up uh, slowly getting more resentful uh, and fighting for independence. So we'll kind of touch upon a couple instances of those. Uh, and generally, you know, just discussing Africa in the 21st century, um, you know, some, uh, you know, modern kind of uh, discussions on, uh, you know, how the growth economically is doing, some challenges that they are facing, uh, and potential perspective on uh, westernization versus keeping maintaining your African roots right and traditions within your own country so um, very interesting um, you know kind of topics that we can have there uh, and so I'm looking forward to discussing it with you today but at least for part one the scramble for Africa right so let's start that um, having some general recap um, getting closer towards the uh, year 1500 right so the year 1500 um, way back when um, you know, we start to uh, kind of see in the historical record that, uh, you know, it, it was not the typical uh, sort of modern concept of, let's say, colonialism and uh, uh, sort of, you know, white oppression, as, fa as it is famously called today, right? Um, it has not really been uh, the case upwards around this point in time um, for various reasons that we're going to get into. Uh, so we have essentially the, uh, at, at this point in time, around 1500, European kingdoms, uh, we have the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, uh, or, well, the remnants of whatever the Ottoman Empire used to be after, um, uh, you know, after it gained some uh, prominence. Uh, so the Ottoman Empire is kind of rising. Uh, we have Islamic rule kind of spreading throughout northern Africa. Uh, but we have a bunch of African kingdoms, right, in uh, the Saharan territory and sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so traditionally, these territories have been uh, pretty safe from, you know, the quote-unquote white invasions uh, due to, uh, you know, malaria, due to other kind of uh, geographical boundaries, the Sahara Desert, right? It was, it was more difficult for folks to kind of penetrate their way into the heart of Africa. And so for centuries, the African kingdoms enjoyed, uh, you know, just typical trade, prosperity, um, you know, with the rest of the Mediterranean, the Middle East, um, a lot of their goods actually making it their way uh, all the way to uh, India and China along the Silk Road. And so even, you know, in like sort of a, uh, a little bit before uh, the year 1500, we had Ghana, which is in Western Africa. Uh, during the sort of heyday of Islam, right, when in Islam and all of the uh, Islamic caliphates were spreading throughout the Middle East uh, and becoming so powerful that they were stretching across northern Africa as well. Um, 
the lands of Ghana were known as the land of gold or El Dorado, as the Spanish would later call it. Uh, because the vast gold mines that they would have um, were so immense, right, that they essentially put themselves on the map. Uh, and so they were enjoying their autonomy. They were enjoying the vast kind of wealth that they were generating and trading with the rest of the world. Uh, and so, you know, all in all, this was a, you know, peaceful trade centered relationship, right, for the you know the few hundred years up to this point. Um, and so uh, sad to say, as time is going to progress, we're going to see a massive shift from this into that sort of colonial mindset. Once we see the uh, age of discovery, once we are going to see the rise of Europe and European hegemony. But as we can see here, this is a huge map of uh, in the on, on the top section, uh, we can see Europe um, going all the way into the uh, Middle East and Turkey and the Levant area. And then on the bottom, it's northern Africa, right? And sort of the Saharan territories. But if you notice, and I'll get my uh, my pointer here. But if you notice here at the bottom, right, the kings are denoted as having gold crowns, right? Um, with all of this vast trade and this trans-Saharan, um, you know, trade routes kind of going through to all of these other various kind of rulers and centers of power throughout these ancient times. And so, you know, the Europeans and the, uh, you know, the Middle Easterners, everyone was very well aware of, let's say, the, you know, uh, powerful and wealthy uh, sort of kings, right, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so definitely on the map, definitely part of this vast trade route, um, you know, of them sending out gold and spices um, and camel products and anything else that they had, right, natural resource wise. So uh, definitely a very cool uh, sort of ancient map for us to look at and study. And this is a more close in depth uh, snapshot of that, right? Um, just having the sort of uh, Ghanaian king sitting on his throne. Um, you know, bejeweled with the crown, right, and sort of the, the golden uh, scepter, right, if you will, and all of these kind of cities uh, surrounding him. And all of the text on the uh, sides is Islamic text. So this is all of the Islamic um, Arabic uh, scholars at the time, right, writing about these faraway lands that they are trading with, um, sometimes having interactions with, right, with the traders across the Trans-Saharan uh, trade. But as you might imagine, crossing the entire breadth of the Saharan desert is a bit of a journey. <laughs> so that was definitely for the longest time a huge barrier between uh, these territories and, let's say, um, any of their northern compatriots. And uh, we're going to revisit a little bit, just a snapshot of um, one or two slides from our, I believe it was the Enlightenment section, if I remember correctly. Uh, but kind of revisiting Prince Henry, right, quote unquote, the navigator. Um, and so the Portuguese really did start it all because they started to um, become more, much more adept at naval trade, at building these larger ships that are capable of all this naval travel. And so they uh, start to explore the you know coasts of Africa because they are trying to establish very profitable and lucrative trade routes to the east, to these uh, large Islamic uh, caliphates, right? These uh, big empires in the Middle East, right? The Ottoman Empire and others um, that are just huge centers of wealth and trade. Um, and so along the, you know, the way, right, the, uh, the Portuguese are stopping by um, India, Brazil, Africa, um, near the Congo, uh, even trading po uh, po ports and posts uh, in Japan, right? So the Portuguese are just, boom, spreading everywhere like a plague. <laughs> and so they're trying to establish all of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade routes, right, that will obviously benefit them and have a mutually kind of beneficial relationship, right? So you, you know, the more trade you have, the more money you could make. And so they started to become the first global sea power during this time. As a result, um, we saw this uh, map uh, previously, right in our uh, Enlightenment lecture. And so as you can tell, going all the way across Africa and just stopping by, um, all of these various kind of locations. But uh, the main reason uh, I started to kind of go into this is, number one, it starts around 1500, right, which is where the class should start moving towards the present. So as far as the history of Africa uh, goes, the sort of Portuguese, European uh, sort of interaction here it is very important. Um, we can kind of move and progress from there. As far as the sort of northern, northeast 
uh, uh, sector, right, which is much more closely tied in with, let's say, the Middle East, um, I will leave that for our Middle East sections um, that are coming up. And so I want to kind of leave that um, into the kind of realm of uh, the Middle Eastern history because it is so heavily influenced by Islam um, and all of the Islamic ruler, rulers and caliphates that I think it would probably be, be, be best if I leave it for that. Um, especially, let's say, I was considering um, adding the history of Egypt right onto here, uh, but Egypt for the longest time was right, under Islamic influence, under Ottoman rule as well. And so I think it best be served for that. Um, and so some have even said that uh, potentially, you know, let's say, uh, Egyptian history, it's kind of like on its own little thing, aside from, let's say, the rest of African history. Uh, and let us not forget that Africa, as this enormous continent, is absolutely vast. Um, and, you know, you could fit in uh, the United States, China, um, and let's say uh, probably most of Europe within all of Africa. Uh, it is such a big continent, so, so much different history there. But the uh, northern part of Africa, right, on top of the Saharan Desert, um, I would say is definitely a little bit more on the Islamic side. So I think I'll leave uh, a lot of that, especially the northeastern side towards the Middle East section. We are going to be covering Morocco and Algeria, though, which is on the northwestern half. So um, as the Portuguese are moving forward uh, with their exploration, with their expansion projects, um, they start to notice that as they are branching off into the uh, um, Caribbean, right, um, and into Brazil later on, that they are getting in short supply of human labor for their agricultural needs, especially their sugar, um, cacao, and coffee bean sort of plantations, right, um, and all of these massive farming endeavors that they're uh, making. And so uh, they inevitably... Uh, begin what which is what is going to become the slave trade right the institutionalized slave trade uh, from Africa moving uh, to right the new world and I'm, I'm gonna touch upon this a little bit up until it gets to let's say the Americas uh, because I do want to leave the Americas for our Americas section uh, but uh, I will kind of detail the covering of sort of this rise of slavery right and the the forced deportation of Africans to the New World um, a little bit. But I will leave the Americas for its actual America section. And so the Portuguese, um, with famous locations such as uh, Elmina, Isle, uh, Elmina uh, Castle, um, you know, started to, uh, off the coast of Ghana, began these vast trading ports of essentially just, you know, shipping millions and millions of Africans from these type of locations. This is one of many. But, you know, these type of locations uh, to sail them across the Atlantic towards South, Central and North America. Um, and so uh, later on, we would see other European nations uh, perform this as well. And we'll get into that in a sec. But Elmina Island um, and the castle it still uh, stands there today. Uh, so you can visit as a tourist attraction um, and see all of the you know various kind of, you know, uh, halls. Right. Um, that so, so many souls had to pass through. And so obviously you have the fortifications, you have all of this kind of um, sort of prison-like, castle-like uh, tendencies to it because, you know, it, at the end of the day, you know, the chance of rebellion, right, is still pretty uh, large. And the fact that they have cannons facing the, uh, the ocean, they did not want this very important and lucrative uh, trade to, let's say, fall under another European power's hands. Um, but as we start to see the uh, sheer scale kind of increase over the years of the amount of people moving through these, um, uh, you know, sort of shipping centers, um, you know, it's it becomes more and more gruesome, right? So as the number of folks increase, we see that the amount of humanity that is being imparted onto them decreases. So they are more and more going to be treated like inhumane beings. Um, and so this is a particular room called the cell of death. Uh, very fitting name, I know. Uh, and so this particular room, and uh, there's a video uh, in a slide or two that details this, but um, th these types of rooms in the castle will just be crammed uh, full of people, right? Waiting for, let's say, the next step or, you know, kind of uh, the next phase of the journey. Um, and as the tour guide kind of goes through these type of rooms, 
Uh, and the reporter themselves even says like, you know, like, what's that smell, right? Because you'll go into the this huge sort of prison like uh, vault and he's like, what's that smell? Uh, and the tour guide replies, he's like, look at your feet. And he's like, okay. He's like, it's sort of like, you know, a red, reddish, br- you know, brown sand, right? Uh, and he's like, he's, well, it's just sand. Um, and then the tour guide says, well, you know, all of the sheer amount of human waste, piss, and let's say um, a menstruation that was just left behind here, it just seeped into the soil, right? And it permanently has this aroma. Um, and so it just gives you sort of this um, very realistic viewpoint of portrayal, right? Of what a lot of these folks had to um, go through, right? The inhumane treatment. Uh, and this is the um, uh, the tour guide, right? That I was talking about. And so it's only a couple minutes long, but if you have an interest, the tour guide kind of goes through and shows you a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, cells and shows you like the small passages that they were uh, going through and just how many folks were really kind of uh, propelled through these types of territories. So definitely worth a watch if you have some time. And now we'll get into the Atlantic slave trade, the Middle Passage, as it is called, right, quote unquote. Um, and so the Middle Passage uh, started in at very, very earliest, 1443, but around 1500, kind of moving its way into the um, uh, 1700s and uh, you know early 1800s as well over time, uh, you know really started to expand what the ideology or what the understanding of slavery was right in the world. So I do have to preface this and say uh, and kind of dispel some of the more modern notions that some might have towards this type of history, uh, where it's not only the sort of quote unquote aggressive white European dominating folks that come in and ravage all of Africa and then force uh, these you know folks out of their homes onto ships etc uh, that's a very simplistic version of it it's more nuanced than that as history typically is and we'll see how um, but in addition to that the concept of slavery is not something new uh, at this point in time, let's say around when our class starts, 1500, right? The year 1500 and moving forward. The concept of slavery was around for centuries, right? And the usage of slaves was around for centuries. Uh, you know, we had the uh, Egyptians uh, performing slavery. We had the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Mongolians, right? So many different uh, peoples around the world were kind of performing these acts of, um, let's say, slavery. The distinction that I will make between those centuries of, uh, let's say, slavery institu- uh, slavery practices versus what we are going to start seeing now into, you know, these uh, newer sort of more modern centuries is that in the past, they would typically be on a smaller scale um, relatively. So, for instance, you conquer a territory, right, or you f- defeat um, another army in battle, right? You could have slaves that you capture um, and, you know, you put them to work in whatever various form you want them to. Um, ancient Rome um, before this was, you know, famous for having, you know, tens of, uh, and hundreds of thousands of slaves throughout the empire, right? Um, because of all the various conquests that they were doing. Not necessarily just black, but it was white on white slavery. Um, we had the Italians enslaving the Germans. We had the Middle Eastern caliphates enslaving other territories that they were conquering, right? Um, and so it was part of life. Now, we are going to start seeing the evolution of that sort of mentality and going from slavery uh, as a sort of spoil of war towards institutionalized slavery. And we'll, we'll discuss the differences here. Uh but what were before we get into that, what were the three stages of the Middle Passage? Um, you know, taking uh, Africans from Africa and shipping them across the Atlantic. Uh, three stages. Number one, first, you had to capture the people, right? You had to capture the Africans from um, not just the coast, but the interior of Africa. Now, uh, the white Europeans and the Portuguese and uh, later on the British and the Dutch and whoever else got into this trade, um, they could not go into the interior of Africa because the white Europeans did not have any immune system against malaria. 
So if, even if they tried to or attempted, they would just die in droves, right? They could not get into the interior of Africa. So what did they do? Uh, they offered all of their uh, goods and services, uh, selling to African tribes on the coast of Africa, telling them that we will give you cotton, rum, guns, gunpowder, pig iron, whatever else you want. Um, and so those coastal tribes went into the heart of Africa and got their enemy tribes, right, or whoever the enemies were, right, the historically speaking, and they dragged them to the coast and then would sell them and give them to the Europeans. So essentially, the very first step of this entire notion of institutionalized slavery that we're going to see uh, moving forward into like modern Western world is, uh, you know, it begins with Africans capturing other Africans. And that's the nuanced part of history that I want to, you know, point out, because it's not usually brought up uh, often in modern discourse, right? It's typically just, well, the white man came in and stole all the Africans. Yes and no, right? It's nuanced. Um, and so it's interesting because from the African perspective, the coastal African uh, settlements and tribes, for them, it was not seen as initially this kind of big evil concept because, like I said before, the slavery was kind of, it was something in the world that was already present. Um, but they eventually did get uh, a bit suspicious because the Europeans kept wanting more and more uh, people. And so eventually the West uh, tribes, the Western tribes were just like, uh, are they cannibals? Are they eating the folks? And so, so we have evidence of um, historical evidence of the f people actually thinking that the Europeans were cannibals and p potentially eating them. Um, but, you know, they were still s selling them, right? So that was, that was step one in the Middle Passage. Step two, uh, you know, very sort of normal, right? You uh, bring all of those folks that you captured and you put them... Uh, onto the coast of Africa uh, so you can sell them and do whatever it is that you need to do. And three, that's the uh, probably the most dangerous of the steps. Um, it's transporting all of these folks, um, putting them on ships and, you know, uh, sailing them across the Atlantic over months of journey. Um, and this was the terrible portion of it, or I would say the, the worst portion of it, because um, all these folks were uh, in very dark, cramped, terrible conditions for months on end, um, very packedly, uh, packed and densely uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, kept in imprisonment, uh, very little exercise, horrible dieting, um, millions dying along the way. So from all of the decades and centuries that we had the Middle Passage open, um, we have estimates, right? And they're not going to be 100% accurate, but we do have, you know, good estimates that do that does change as the historical analysis kind of progresses. And so we have estimates that perhaps upward of 40% died on the Middle Passage. And so that would equate to approximately 8 million Africans dying on the route to Africa. Um, and so here's a, a nice video um, kind of detailing what the slave trade was and the Middle Passage was from a TED Talk. Um, so if you have a few minutes of time, this kind of puts it into uh, perspective for you a little bit. Um, here is a primary source from Thomas Philip. He was a slave trader in the Middle Passage in 1693. Um, and so I'll read some of it to you and we can kind of analyze it from here. And so he says, The Negroes are so willful and loth to leave their own country that they have often leapt out of the canoes, boat and ship, into the sea, and kept under water till they were drowned to avoid being taken up and saved by our boats, which pursued them. They, having a more dreadful apprehension of Barbados, that is the Caribbean's quote-unquote, than we can have of hell, though in reality they live much better there than in their own country. But home is home. We have likewise seen divers of them eaten by the sharks, of which a prodigious number kept about the ships in this place, and I have been told will follow her hence to Barbados, for the dead Negroes that have thrown overboard in the passage... We had about 12 Negroes did willfully drown themselves and others starve themselves to death, for it is their belief that when they die, they return home to their own country and friends again. Now, uh, end quote. This is a very interesting uh, passage because this individual, Thomas Philip, sees that the Africans are now understanding over time what this is going to mean for them, right? The fact that they were put on these ships, what the entire voyage is going to consist of. 
and what awaits them, uh, you know, in the new world. And so a lot of them were choosing just to jump off the ships and kill themselves, right, to spare them of this kind of fate. Uh, and so it just it puts things into a greater perspective of just how terrible the situation really, really was. Um, and so over time, we start getting this uh, Atlantic slave trade, right, from Africa, uh, millions and millions of folks, um, you know, brought over to the New World, to Brazil, uh, the Dutch West Indies, French West uh, Indies, the Caribbeans, the Spanish Empire, and of course, the British North America, or where we are today, uh, the United States of America, right? Um, and I will leave those sections for the Americas um, and uh, have a closer discussion of um, slavery then. But this is just to kind of keep the African context of early European to African relations, right? Putting that into context of what the early relations were. Uh, but here we can see uh, these early uh, sort of drawings, right? Of these people put into the ships. And as you can tell, there's absolutely no room for them to move around. They are not being treated like human beings. They are being treated like property, uh, like inanimate objects, literally packed like sardines, right? If you've ever opened up a sardine can, the fish, little sardines are just nicely packed in. You know, you're, you're just, it's like you're sitting in the middle of a airplane aisle, right? There's no room for you to breathe. Um, and imagine just laying there like that for like two, three months. Um, and so they would... Just, you know, just leave them like this. Um, and so, yes, they would give them water and food here and there. But uh, once again, uh, the, the main aspect of this was just their property. We are shipping them off and selling them. Um, initially, the death rate was so catastrophic that even the uh, ship um, sort of captains uh, saw that their quote unquote product was dying off. So eventually the uh, treatment got a little bit better in the food and the water and giving them some exercise here and there, right? Um, because they understood that otherwise everyone's just going to die in droves. So what's the point for them of doing all of this um, if, you know, they, they, let's say, cannot sell their product at market? Um, but nonetheless, terrible situations. Um, another example of just how, uh, let's say, the, uh, the situation was and how crammed uh, everything you know, was. Uh, and here's a uh, sort of drawing representation, right? Kind of giving them off the coast of Africa and kind of putting them under, um, you know, and, uh, you know, starting the uh, journey. Uh, if you've ever seen Roots, and this is on Amazon Prime. So if you have access to Amazon, you can just go in and watch it. Um, this is from a very realistic TV show called Roots. Um, and this particular scene, uh, it's only a couple minutes long, but it details some of the sort of uh, middle passage, you know, highlights of them being captured, uh, put onto the ship, <clears throat> put below deck, um, and some of the, uh, let's say, experiences that they had kind of, you know, just going crazy because you can't move. Uh, so a little bit on the explicit side um, or uh, quote unquote graphic side, there's nothing too crazy going on, right? Cause this is on the history channel. So it's, it's, there's like no nudity here, but, uh, you know, if, if you, if you do feel uneasy or uncomfortable seeing folks shackled and just kind of, you know, trying to free themselves, um, under deck, then perhaps skip this video. Otherwise it's a, a couple of minutes long. And so it can give you, um, that much more of a perspective, right. Um, onto how these folks, um, lived for a couple of months during the journey. <clears throat> And so here we start to get into institutionalized slavery. Um, and that's the discussion that I wanted to have, uh, you know, and make the difference between, let's say, the ancient version of slavery, whatever that was, the sort of spoils of war and this institutionalized slavery. <clears throat> so slavery in its form and facet is any system that is essentially stripping individuals of their rights and their freedoms and you are forced to do things that you do not want to do. All humanity is stripped from you. Uh, and you are no longer treated like a human being, but you are treated, and this is a particular word that is used, um, especially in uh, later on United States and British legal terms, chattel. The term of chattel means property. You are an item of property. So you are no longer a human being. You are an object. You are like an iPhone or something, right? It's like you're just property to buy and sell 
at will. Um, <clears throat> and so as the European demand for all of those uh, plantations we talked about, the tobacco, uh, rice, uh, sugarcane plantations, right, in the Caribbeans and South, Central, North America, all of those. As the demand is growing, um, all these European powers started to ask themselves, okay, well, you know, who can we put to work on the plantations? They first tried indentured servants. Uh, that didn't work too great. Uh, indentured servants were essentially mostly kind of European white folks that were thrown in jail. They gave them the option of like, hey, do you want to spend 20 years in jail for... Um, you know, kind of looting and raping your way through the city of Paris? Or do you want to be shipped to America and you're going to be, let's say, a servant for your master, etc., for like five years, 10 years, however long the contract was for? Um, and so that system, that's a whole nother conversation. But indentured servitude did not work out great because a lot of these folks were, you know, like kind of uh, lighter skinned Europeans, right? Uh, and so if they uh, left or they ran away or whatever, um, they were much harder to track down um, the sheer number of people that were elected f that were volunteering right for uh, indentured servitude were not vast right and so they needed more population then they started to consider okay what about Native Americans can we put them to work on the plantations that did not work great because they were susceptible to European diseases and then all throughout the Americas they were just dying in droves which we will get to in our Americas section later on so essentially, no sane person is going to want to do this back-breaking plantation work. Then they started to say, aha, Africa. Um, and so for them, it was a sort of a good middle ground. Um, they are of darker skin color, so easily identifiable in a majority white population. So if they ran, uh, ran away, right, you can kind of uh, bring them back to the plantation. And number two, um, because Africans did have more interactions with Europeans versus, let's say, Native Americans, they did have resistance to some of the European diseases. They were not dying off in droves. Um, and so for those reasons, over time, we see the evolution of Africans being chosen for this sort of institutionalized slavery. Um, and oh, well, actually, before I get into this, just to close off this, um, so what is the main difference between slavery in the ancient times and institutionalized slavery? Ancient slavery, right, in the Middle East, in Europe, um, you know, Northern Africa, Sub Saharan Africa, etc. Used to be spoils of war, right? I defeat you in battle, I can take a few prisoners here and there. It's on a smaller scale. Institutionalized slavery becomes this business where millions upon millions of people are shipped for the specific purpose of being slaves. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, where's that map? <clears throat> interestingly enough, from this map that I showed you and all of these people moving uh, throughout all of the Americas, um, we see the largest uptick of population in North America with the British colony or what would become the United States of America later on. Because um, later on, they start to essentially just... Uh, practice eugenics and you know have them breed right and reproduce amongst each other um, and so all of this turns towards essentially making it into a business right instead of spoils of war you now have a large uh, form business that is being made um, and so uh, this is the sort of the introduction of the european african relations right and fit uh, around 1500 moving forward uh, i will leave the rest of it uh, for the Americas section, obviously, a lot of that is going to detail in like US history, Central South American history, etc. So I'll leave it for that. Um, but this is kind of just an introduction. Now that we're going into the 15th century slash uh, going into, let's say the 19th century, right, all of these centuries from like 1500 up to the late 1800s, uh, we start to see that these European powers, right, are growing the center of power is shifted to the age of Europe, as we've seen in some of our previous lectures, with the Reformation, the Enlightenment, all of these philosophies and big empires, right, kind of growing, and all of the centers of uh, strength and economic prowess and military ambitions are growing. And so as the competition between the nations of Europe um, continue, right, as they're uh, sort of slitting each other's throats on the f battlefields of Europe, um, they want to grow and expand their empire abroad. 
They want to have territory. They want to have as much uh, influence around the world as possible, access to goods, and extract resources where possible, right, for the prestige of the nation. And so we start to get a term called the scramble for Africa, because Africa was, once again, a large, large continent. Uh, and so, you know, vast with mineral wealth, right, and other goods that they could uh, strip. And so the scramble for Africa was essentially the occupation, division, colonization, and annexation of Africa by all of these European powers in this kind of period of imperialism, right? And so at the Berlin Conference, uh, towards the tail end of the 1800s, uh, we start to see that as Germany and Italy are also starting to grow as powers and military com uh, competitors, um, we start to see that the European uh, kings and the European nations are starting to bicker. They're starting to say, well, we, you know, uh, you can't just come in and gain our African territory and blah, blah, blah. We've uh, you laid claim to it. And so they essentially come together in a kind of diplomatic way and say, OK, fine, let's bring up the map of Africa and we will redraw the lines and give a little to you and give a little to you. So essentially, the Europeans come together and want every single person wants their own slice of the pie. And so here they're sort of discussing who was going to get what type of territory, etc. Um, and in between uh, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, right, all of these um, groups, right, everybody wants their own section or slice of the African pie. Um, and so they are trying to obviously maintain the status quo. They're trying to gain more power and leverage for their nation, obviously is going to be at the expense of Africans. And so within a very short amount of time from 1880, which has already seen, right, some colonization efforts here and there um, by the British, by the French, but on smaller scales, um, you know, we start to see that within a couple of decades, right, after they sort of agreed at the Berlin Conference to divvy up Africa, it is widespread. And so by 1913, uh, right before World War I really starts to get started, uh, we start to see that all of these territories ended up kind of gobbling up all of Africa and just sectioning it off. Um, and so the I do have to give one shout out, and we will talk about that later. Um, and let me get my uh, pointer. Um, and so the main kind of hero in this tale is Ethiopia. And so shout out to my Ethiopians, which actually do uh, historically and modernly have uh, a big Armenian population there. But that's a discussion for another time. Um, but Ethiopia was the only country that actually was able to just push back the wave of armies and colonization efforts by the Europeans. Uh, in their case, the Italians. We'll get to them in a bit, but that's a precursor. But as you can see, the rest of the African continent did not have as much success um, because the Europeans were coming in with their modern guns rifles, cannons, weaponry, um, and it was just, it was too much, right? It was too much uh, military strength for the African tribes and nations to withstand at this point in time. Um, and so, yeah, we end up getting the um, unfortunate sort of sectioning off of all of Africa. And now comes in our uh, little case studies, right? Uh, because through the readings, there are all of these instances of uh, we were they were discussing Belgium, France, Britain, uh, going into all of these kind of sectors of Africa. You can make an entire history of Africa course over 16 weeks, and that still will not be enough, right? Um, it is not a country; is it? It is a continent, right? It's it's enormous, um, and so. You know, very similarly to if I had, let's say, if I told all of you, oh, this is a history of Europe class in six weeks. Every <laughs> Europe is so uh, diverse and different depending on every single nation, right? It It's, you know, kind of close or similarity to that, I suppose. But um, we're going to be going through some little uh, sort of case studies. So let's talk about Belgium. Uh, Belgium has been in the news recently, um, if you've been reading, uh, for King Leopold II and a bunch of these statues of King Leopold II modernly um, after the COVID-19 uh, situation and the Black Lives Matter protests um, have been uh, getting defaced and pulled down um, for just, uh, you know, his terrible uh, history, um, you know, towards the African people. And so let's 
look in detail and analyze some of King Leopold II's history with Africa. So he was the second king of the Belgians um, and, you know, was in charge of Belgium, which was a pretty small nation, right? It was a pretty small nation in terms of uh, European power and dominance. They weren't France, they weren't Britain, they weren't Germany or Prussia, these kind of larger entities. Yeah, it was Belgium. You know, they're, 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 they were there. They had their chocolate. Um, and so, but King Leopold II had like these grand ideas of increasing Bel Belgian strength. Um, and so he sent this explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, uh, to go through Africa and tell him what portion of Africa would be best for him to, let's say, advocate controlling at the Berlin Conference. Uh, and so he came back and said, ah, this area of the Congo would be perfect for you. And let me show you. So the Congo, right, Belgium here in purple, right in the middle, um, that is going to be the entire area of the sort of democratic uh, state of Congo. And so at the conference, he ends up uh, telling them that, oh, listen, uh, I want this particular section and slice of the pie of Africa. Um, and we will make it, we will call it the Congo Free State because, you know, I want to go in and help the Africans and civilize them and educate them, etc. Right. So he was advocating for, you know, a good, let's say, um, theoretically, ideologically good, whatever, natured um, intent. In practice, though, um, the Congo Free State ended up being one of those brutal and repressive and harsh territories in all of Africa. Right. And so that's why modernly with the Black Lives Matter protests and movements, um, the statues are being just ridiculed and torn down because of all of this kind of uh, his history of brutality to the people. And so the Congo Free State was born. But interestingly enough, instead of it being, uh, let's say, part of Belgium originally, uh, within the papers that he signed with the European nations, uh, the Congo Free State actually became King Leopold II's private territory. So he technically owned it not Belgium itself. Um, and so most of the vast wealth that was um, extracted from the uh, Congo at this time actually went into his pockets, which he funneled into Swiss bank accounts. And so who knows how many hundreds of millions or however much he ended up just, you know, pilfering um, from all of this. But it was an enormous amount for sure. Uh, and so the sort of era of Belgian oppression began um, with the introduction of the force uh, publique. It was Leopold's private army. Um, and so this was kind of the militarized force that was created throughout um, the uh, Congo to enforce Belgian colonial rule. Um, early on, uh, they were used primarily uh, sort of against uh, or like on paper, right, quote unquote, uh, to protect the natives against these savage Arabic slave traders, right? Uh, but pretty soon it became clear that they were there uh, specifically for protecting Leopold's economic interests in the Congo and extracting all these resources for him. And so eventually, um, as Leopold II kept telling his uh, force publique that I want my quotas met, I want the resources extracted. I'm not going to take no for an answer. As he started getting more brutal with his uh, quotas, uh, the force publique started getting more brutal as well. And so oftentimes we would see, and I'm going to show some uh, photographs of this in a second. Um, and so if you're a little squeamish, try to uh, sort of, you know, go through the photos quickly. Um, but if let's say the African workers were not, meeting their daily quotas, they would just end up cutting off their hand, right, as an example. And so what many of these uh, officers ended up doing, the Belgian officers, um, they would just end up cutting off their hands anyways, or killing them, um, and then getting, let's say, 10 or however many hands, and just kind of reporting it and just tossing it on the table um, as evidence and example of, uh, oh, this was uh, me doing good police work. Or good enforcement work because you know the, the you know I'm, I'll try to do a very bad sort of impression but the, you know like oh the Africans they're not working or whatever um, and so here's ten hands because I was oppressing them and I was you know whipping them into shape 
Uh, and so uh, we have some estimates that within this couple decade period, maybe 10 plus million of these Congolese had died um, due to all of this repression and occupation, just absolutely brutal. One junior officer commented on an order that he got from uh, higher up officers to raid slash punish a village that let's say did not meet their quota as much as they should have. They ordered us to cut off the heads of the men and hang them on the village palisades. That, that means the village walls. And to hang the women and the children on the uh, supposed to be palisade in the form of a cross. And so, as you can tell, number one, very brutal repression here. Number two, if you're hanging the bodies of the women and the children specifically in a cross, I mean, how much symbolism is that supposed to represent? It's symbolizing the sort of a dominant authoritative power that you have over the people um, that you're introducing uh, crimes against humanity because you don't care if they're men, women or children, you'll slaughter all of them. And number three, you're somehow implementing God into it. So all of this kind of narratives of westernization and bringing religion and education to these folks and civilizing them, but at the same time, you're brutalizing them in that method or fashion doesn't doesn't quite make sense. But um, so many different kind of intersectional, uh, you know, thoughts and patterns kind of go into this period of time. And so the force publique um, is created, right, obviously headed by the Belgium officers, but it's terrible because the force publique were made up of Congolese, right? The majority of these men are black Congolese Africans. And so it's sad because you have Africans now policing other Africans on the behest of um, the, uh, the Belgians. And so it's very sad because their people are essentially now uh, going against their own. Um, and so many of them are forced to work um, in the rubber um, industry because Belgium was uh, not Belgium, excuse me, the Congo was rich um, initially with rubber. And so during this period of time of the 1880s, 1890s, 1900, uh, you know, we were seeing with our industrialization section, right? Cars are being made, factories and all these kind of industries, but especially with the advent of um, how you can use rubber to make tires, tires for bicycles, tires for vehicles and cars and all these different type of uh, industries uh, started to become more popular. So the need for rubber around the world was exploding. And so King Leopold II saw his Congo acquisition as just a gold mine, right? He's just like, keep extracting rubber. I need it for money. Um, but the world slowly but surely started to notice uh, the brutal repressions that were made here as the um, sort of evidence on the right hand side. So as the European nations and others are sort of hushing and whispering about what's happening in the Congo, um, the, uh, the Africans are suffering. And so although Leopold II um, ended up uh, into, you know, living into his old age and be being a monstrously rich individual, right, because most of his money was in the Swiss bank accounts, how much we, we don't know, it was it was considerable. Um, Although he became a rich man, he never actually stepped foot in the Congo itself because I'm pretty sure he wanted to, to have been as disconnected as possible from all of the policies at the Congo. Um, and so, you know, and he did not want to see his policies and actions, such as on the right hand side, um, no pun intended, uh, with, you know, folks having their hands chopped off for quotas, right? Just to make an example out of them. Um, and so sites like these were sad to see, but, you know, uh, not terribly uncommon. And here's a video um, about the Belgian Congo uh, detailing uh, the history of how the Congo was created, um, the history of the force publique of King Leopold II, and kind of puts all this into more perspective uh, with photos, videos, uh, like early on videos that they took as well. Um, and so definitely worth a watch um, for you to kind of put all of this into perspective. I, if I remember correctly, it's I think around 15 minutes long, something like that, but definitely worth a watch um, if you have some time. And as the Congo started to gain reputation as being this brutal uh, place in the world under the Belgian uh, chocolate thumb, uh, we have various people that actually had a conscience and wanted to speak out. And so one of those instances was Heart of Darkness. 
And this was a novel written by Joseph Conrad about the Congo. And so the narration, the narration of the novel um, talks about some friends boarding a boat, going through the Thames and kind of discussing the Congo and their experiences. Um, and so in the novel, Conrad was describing also his an intertwining his own experiences, viewing what was happening in the Congo itself. Um, and so a report to a foreign office later said that the root of the evil lies in the fact that the government of the Congo is above all a commercial trust, that everything else is oriented towards commercial gain. And so essentially the Congo in its entirety was just made for a um, as a for profit endeavor, not to help the community, not to bring westernization and religion to the folks. It was just to brutalize them and ex uh, extract resources as fast as possible. But as heart, oh, and I do have to add, why did the uh, author name it Heart of Darkness as the novel? This is an interesting part. Uh, he named it Heart of Darkness because many of these European officers that were going and being shipped off to the Congo to, let's say, enact all of these policies and such, uh, they felt that they were so far removed from their families, from modern civilized life, from Europe, etc., that they were going to this, this far away, godforsaken place with no rules, no restrictions, and no societal governance. And so he named the novel Heart of Darkness to signify that in a sort of lawless world, quote unquote, your deepest and darkest desires are now unleashed, right? There's no one stopping you from cutting off people's hands, from beating somebody an inch to, of their life, from just raping the local girls in the village, right? Um, and so Heart of Darkness really had, uh, you know, this sort of important nuanced uh, sort of explanation and meaning behind it. And so the, uh, in response to Heart of Darkness and the rising uh, sort of uh, truth that was coming out, right? Uh, Leopold, with his vast wealth, um, started to have a massive counter campaign to nullify these rumors. So initially, if you remember, he was telling the other Europeans, oh, well, I'm going the Congo is this beautiful place and I'm bringing education and religion to these godforsaken people, etc. Uh, he started to invite many of these foreign dignitaries to con the Congo, but very similar to how North Korea does it. Um, or how China used to do it, um, they would bring you on essentially a glorified tour. And anything you would see would be perfect, right? The towns and villages would be perfect and spot on. Any local Congo folks will be clean and dressed um, and educated and well-mannered and be like, I love my life here and whatever, right? They're giving you sort of this glamorized propaganda. Uh, and so, you know, he tried to outpace all the negative critiques that were coming out with positive reviews and critiques. But the main point here is that Leopold II was trying to show the world, right, his veiled uh, perception of what the Congo was uh, and that it was free, it was prosperous, the folks were well-educated and they were doing good in the world. In reality, uh, the folks were suffering terribly, right, under the uh, repressive sort of regime. Um, and so even though Leopold II made it out, right, super rich, uh, it ended up being a terrible crime to humanity. And only later on in the mid-1900s would the Congo finally um, have uh, its first president realized, right, and signing the various um, agreements with the European nations stating that the Congo is now a free and independent um, state. Um, and so that kind of leads us into, um, you know, later what would be the post-colonial African history. Um, and so it is definitely um, a brutal snapshot, right, of King Leopold II. Um, and perhaps if you are uh, turning on the news uh, modernly and all the statues around the world are kind of being toppled over and folks are saying this person was racist and this person did horrible things in the past. Um, out of all of the different types of statues that are being toppled over, some justified, some probably less so justified, or some kind of having gray area in the middle, because nobody's perfect, right, in history. 
uh, I think Leopold II probably safely is solidified as one of the statues that probably should be put down. <laughs> right? He was a very brutal, repressive person. Uh, and so post-colonial Africa, let's get into this section. And let's talk about the French for a little bit, the French assimilation system. So if the Belgian example was we are here for money and extraction of resources, which is what they did, and they did so in a glorious fashion, uh, the French example would be assimilation. So the French, in a very French way, they want everyone else to be French, right? Because, <laughs> right? Um, French is the best language in the world. Our food and cuisine is the, the, the best in the world, right? And so they're trying to Frenchify everyone. I, I think that's a word, Frenchify. I don't know if it's a word, but I just made it a word. So they tried to Frenchify everyone. Um, <laughs> and so through assimilation policies, um, and what is assimilation? Assimilation is you want for you, the per person or the group, if you are coming into the majority uh, group, then we want for you to speak our language, be part of our culture, eat our food. We want you to be us now. Um, so let's say um, if you are of Armenian descent and you come to the United States, a full assimilation would be you inevitably forget your Armenian heritage, you forget your Armenian language, you forget your Armenian culture and your foods, and now you are just American, right? You kind of forego all of that and you are part of the larger collective. And so France tried to institute this. So as they were having these uh, regions that they controlled within Africa, they started to create actual political systems, right? Administrations um, called the Sersle uh, uh, system. And so they were kind of various little admins here and there. But, you know, it was part of France. It was part of the overall kind of overseas economy and politics and whatever else. Um, but these sort of militarized territories that were sort of like quasi political as well um, were set up in a way where uh, you know the folks did not have an equal access to the political system and we'll get into that in a slide or two uh, but uh, this territory or region where france had a lot of influence and domination was called the Maghreb, defined as kind of western north africa uh, Northwest Africa, west of Egypt type of territories where um, we had Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, right? Those types of areas. Um, and then France also went all the way around to the east coast of Africa and got Madagascar as well. Uh, and so one of the most famous examples of all of them were Al was Algeria. Algeria was uh, you know, a very kind of so solid a a portion of the French holdings and was, you know, one of the closest geographically to France, right? So they had a very kind of close relationship. And so they were under colonial rule, um, you know, from around 1830s, uh, all even before the Belgium agreements, before the scramble for Africa. They were there pretty early on um, until their independence in 1962. And so eventually, well, before I get there, uh, what we initially see is that uh, the Ottomans were initially in control of this type of territory as like a regional subsidiary. Um, and they were getting into conflict with the French. Eventually, the French came in and blockaded Algiers. And through them getting into the spat with the Ottomans, um, the local Algerian uh, uh, sort of administrators and territories, the French came in with military and essentially invaded. Um, and so with their heavy military invasion, um, approximately 500,000 to 1 million Algerians were kind of uh, lost during this exchange of power between the Ottomans and the French. But once they became part of the sort of French rule, um, over time they started to get more and more uh, clashes between the locals and the French. And so this is uh, supposed to demonstrate, you know, France coming in during those early battles um, and taking it away from the uh, from the Ottomans, right? The the, the Muslims. Um, and so you can tell even here on the right hand side, the French troops are portrayed in a very European esque way. Um, and then the rest of the uh, sort of Algerian troops are portrayed as sort of like this Islamic uh, Muslim contingency right with their sort of islamic sort of uh um, curved sabers um in the right hand top right hand corner the green flag is supposed to be the flag of the crescent moon 
um, you know, a very kind of Islamic uh, religious symbol. Um, and so all of these kind of various, uh, you know, uh, visual representations of the battles, right? And so eventually, um, as we start to get through all of the history of Algeria um, being part of, you know, uh, being part of France, uh, you know, we can have a discussion of what worked and what did not work. Uh, so eventually we start to see that Algeria wanted their own independence um, and created the war of independence um, through the uh, liberation movement. And so they wanted to become decolonized. They didn't, no longer wanted to be part of France. Um, and, you know, they were using guerrilla tactics, um, scorched, uh, scorched earth tactics as well, uh, use of torture, anything that they could do to get themselves out of the clutches of the French. And so in one of the more famous work, The Stranger by Albert uh, Camus, uh, they were having d some discussions and themes of decolonization and relationship between the occupier and occupied um, in that book. But eventually in 62, Algeria did get it, its uh, independence. But what was, you know, the legacy of sort of French assimilation policies? Did it work? Did it not work? Um, one of the main legacies was their quote unquote civilizing mission or their mission civilizatrice. Um, it was a rationale that it is OK for you to go and colonize a people and their lands because you are spreading civilization to them. You are bringing this westernization to these barbaric and indigenous people that are living in rags and they do not worship the God you worship in. And how can they live like this? They're heathens, right? It is the civilizing mission um, that they tell themselves as justification for uh, going in and conquering to make yourself sleep at night, right? And so the use of this civilizing mentality was that we are going to educate them, we are going to enlighten them and bring civilization for these peoples. But as you and I are historians here, let us not kid ourselves. The number one reason for this was power and resource extraction. So if France is conquering and gobbling up all this territory, it means that they want all of the mines and resources and spices and everything else they have to offer, they want it brought back to France so they can enrich themselves at the cost of other people, right? Um, but this is sort of the sort of salt and the sprinkles up top just to make it look nice. Well, we are also civilizing them. So an attempt to cover your tracks, so to speak. Um, but the liberation movements and the civil wars that they were going through, right, and the various guerrilla warfare was brutal. You know, death uh, was handed swiftly. Um, you know, uh, folks and Algerians uh, left on the streets, um, you know, shot. Uh, as examples to the rest of the population not to uprise. But once people start seeing photographs like this on the left-hand side, it angers them more and more. And so we start getting massive uh, protests, right? We start getting massive uh, demonstrations, right? People wanting their independence and their freedom. Um, and so we start to get folks in the streets, in the tens and hundreds of thousands, wanting independence. And when popular movement is so popular um, over time, you cannot stop the change. And eventually we have the uh, first Algerian president sworn in uh, and during the first speech saying that no longer will French occupation uh, kind of rule over the land. Algeria will now be ruled by Algerians, right? Um, and so as we can see, the flag is being utilized here right, the, with the crescent moon as far as the Islamic sort of traditions that they have. Um, and so, yeah. And this is a beautiful shot of, um, you know, the French uh, troops standing in the uh, midst of uh, one of the uh, sort of larger cities in Algeria. Um, and so all of the sort of uh, architecture in the background, right? Um, with the Muslim influence of architecture, right? Um, it's, it stands in stark contrast, right? So here is sort of a photograph of the occupiers versus the occupied, right, so to speak. But why did all these assimilation policies fail um, within Algeria and Morocco as well? Um, we can start with uh, Algeria because we were just on the topic and then I'll kind of 
uh, double back towards Morocco, which we have not discussed. But with Algeria, for instance, uh, it did not work because they had no political representation or they had political representation, but not equal. So although they were Algeria as a territory, as a military territory, was part of the French Empire, quote unquote, the people were not given complete equal political or economic status. And so over time, this was uh, very dissatisfying to the Muslims. Um, because if you, if you know your history, and we'll get into this with our Middle Eastern sections, but in Islamic culture, if you are Muslim, and you're living in a Muslim empire, uh, the Muslims are the top tier of the society. And then below you can be Christians, can be pagans, it could be anybody else. As long as they pay their taxes, you don't care. But the Muslims are number one. And so suddenly, them becoming the second class citizens below the French, for them, it, even religiously, it did not sit well. Um, and politically, it did not sit well, obviously. And so over time, the resentment was growing and growing, eventually leading to the inevitable war of independence that they needed to have. And so whenever a group of people are, you know, consistently just held back, and treated like second class citizens, it is going to cause resentment. It is going to cause upheaval eventually. And another example we have here is Morocco. We'll just touch upon that a little bit. Um, but for Moroccans, the French uh, occupations there, uh, you know, it did not work because for the Moroccans, tradition for them was very important. Right. Just as the Algerians, but for the Moroccans, I would say a little bit more on the tradition side. Um, so these colonial people, uh, the Moroccans, were not accepting any of these assimilation approaches that France was trying to institute um, because they did not want to let go their centuries of tradition, of culture, of language, of things that they were doing. Moroccans had a thousand year tradition of being independent and kind of being on the outskirts of Islam. Right. They weren't directly under the control of um, the Ottomans for all of this time, but they were kind of on the outskirts. They were still Islamic, but they were independent. They had their freedom, right? They liked their freedom. And so now suddenly they're being under this French protector or ruler. To them, it was just unacceptable. It's like, no, we were free for a thousand years. Like, why do we need this? So once again, resentment, resentment is building and growing, but for a slightly different reason. Eventually, the Moroccans coming together as well and larger and larger groups and demonstrations wanting uh, freedom, right? Advocating for uh, freedom against the uh, French occupiers, right? And even the military getting um, involved here. Oh, let me uh, put up. Uh, do not disturb. There we go. Um, and eventually we have here a photograph of King Mohammed V. Um, and so he was uh, at one point in time uh, within Morocco exiled, um, uh, you know, for various political reasons, but eventually brought back um, to rule. Um, and his son that succeeded him um, made the Independence Day uh, from the French. Uh, he moved the Independence Day from March, I believe it was like March 2nd over to November um, to commemorate his father's death, but also use that as the sort of uh, new independence day and so uh, you know the kingdom of morocco still persists today um, and so they were proud people and you know all of the uh, videos and photographs i see modernly of people traveling through morocco it looks absolutely stunning right and so maybe one day um, i can be fortunate enough to go through my uh, travels through northern africa and perhaps stop by uh, marrakesh right in morocco um, and sit down at a local hookah lounge and just enjoy, right? Um, so it definitely has a lot of history to it, a lot of culture, a lot of architecture, and a lot of beauty. Let's talk about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a interesting uh, case because out of all of the European nations, out of all the European countries, uh, they were the one country that resisted European conquest. Uh, and so they were just sticking out like a sore thumb. You know, they were unique. They were the ones that fought back the Europeans. So how did they do so? It all began with our main squeeze, uh, Toedros II. 
um, who was ruling uh, during this time, uh, during the initial conquests, and his sons and his grandchildren obviously continued the fight. But during the first Italo-Ethiopian War, uh, the Italians were the ones that wanted to come in and carve up this area for themselves. But uh, one main thing uh, prevented them. Uh, Ethiopia was in talks with Russia. Good old Russia coming back into the fray. You thought Russia was gone from world history? Think again. Russia is everywhere. You do not watch TV. TV watches you, right? So Russia comes back in the photo, um, in the picture. And so uh, Russia, because uh, they were Orthodox Christian, Ethiopians were also Orthodox Christian. They were similar religion. Um, the Ethiopians essentially asked the Russians, hey, listen, can you please help us and send us weapons and help us train? The Russians said, but why? And so they respond with, well, we're both Orthodox Christians, etc. And the Catholics are wanting to come in and conquer us. And then the Russians just respond with, yes, we help you. And so they ended up helping, uh, sending um, military advisors, army training, modern weapons for them to, to get a hold of. And so once the Italians started to come in, you know, with their forces, uh, they were shocked and surprised that the, Alge um, that the uh, Ethiopians were not only uh, more numerous than they had anticipated, but they were well armed and trained of, you know, modern combat. Um, and so in the Battle of Adwa uh, in 1896, the Ethiopians drove back the Italians. Um, there, this would not be the first time uh, that the Italians would attempt this. Uh, later on, during World War II under Mussolini, I believe, they finally ended up uh, occupying the territory for a short stint of time. Um, but at least during this entire phase of, you know, the scramble for Africa and Europeans colonizing all of Africa, the Ethiopians pushed them back. And so the main point of this was um, this for the African people, right, as a, a pan-African sort of ideology and culture and the people in general. This was seen as a huge victory because in all of Africa, right, just, you know, they're being conquered up left and right by the Portuguese, uh, the French, the Brits. And then the Ethiopians were that one symbol of resistance. They were the ones that punched back and sent the Italians flying away. And so this was a rallying cry for Africans, not only during this time, but over the next few decades, kind of leading up to all of these post-colonial revolutions that they were having. The Afrocentric uh, scholar Molefe Asante even wrote, After the victory over Italy in 1896, Ethiopia acquired a special importance in the eyes of Africans as the only surviving African state. Ethiopia became emblematic of African valor and resistance. Hope to thousands of Africans who were experiencing the full shock of European conquest and were beginning to search for an answer to the myth of African inferiority. And that last part is interesting because although, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, of course, right? And so, you know, in the modern context, we can see that, you know, obviously, militarily, things were a bit skewed, right? Between a lot of the African nations and the Europeans, them coming in with these brand new guns and cavalry units and saber swords and cannons and all of this right you can't it was a it was a difference of military strength uh but as the people of africa were getting essentially subjugated and colonized you know that that messes with your head a bit you know it's like are are our people inferior right all of these like social darwinist practices that the europeans and the americans were proliferating uh, using Charles Darwin's theories of evolution and manipulating and bastardizing it into what was called social Darwinism, which was a uh, sort of excuse saying that white people are genetically superior, black people are genetically inferior, right? All of these things happening at the same time. So as many Africans were sort of thinking to themselves and trying to process all of this, at least this Ethiopian victory was like a rallying cry towards, you know, some of this is probably BS, right? And it's only the circumstance of the day. It's not a true ingrained sort of viewpoint of what it is. And so this defeat, uh, uh, you know, that 
Ethiopia handed to Italy was also the rallying cry, like we said earlier, for all of these future nationalist movements for decolonization and for future activists and leaders of this pan-African movement, right, to rise up truly. Um, and so this was not uh, the first African victory over Western colonizers, um, but it was the first time that a African military power put a dead stop to the European powers, right? Um, and so, you know, later Mussolini did have a, uh, a very short-lived successful invasion of Ethiopia, but not for too long. But at least Ethiopia was the one banner of just resistance. And so here we have the local um, Ethiopian militia armed with uh, the Russian uh, rifles, right? And uh, if you can tell, and where's my, I have my pointer somewhere here. There we go. If you can tell over here in the background, we have the Russian uh, officers, right? Um, over here, the Russian officers uh, helping and training and doing, uh, you know, what they can for the folks and the people. And so we see that a lot of the military contingents were a mixture and combination between local tribes and local, um, you know, military fighting styles mixed in with, let's say, the rifles. The gentleman on the right hand side on horseback, he has a rifle in his hand, right? And so both an intermixed and also a semi-professional army right being formed. Um, on the right hand side, we have uh, Nikolai uh, Lientiev, uh, one of the Russian participants in the Battle of Adwa and one of the uh, sort of military advisors and officers um, assigned there by the Russian Tsar. Uh, and so right they're they're training, they're helping the folks out, they're giving the weapons. And so it seems as though uh, Russia has a uh, history of trying to stick it to the uh, to the Catholics, right? Because <laughs> they're Orthodox Christians. I guess they don't like the, uh, the Catholics. So if you ever want the Russians help, just tell them the Catholics are after us. And then they'll be like, what? <laughs> we must help. Um, so uh, kudos to the Russians for helping the uh, Ethiopians. Um, on the left hand side, this is a, um, you know, older uh, sort of painting uh, depicting the fight of the Battle of Adwa. Um, and so um, on the right hand side, uh, we have the Italians, right, with their modern weaponry uh, firing away. On the left hand side, we have the more numerous um, Ethiopians with their, um, if you can tell, and let me get the pointer, if you can tell, right, with their uh, generals and leaders, um, not having this kind of like angelic of, you know, look to them, but, you know, kind of very important with the military garb, right? And like probably uh, chief leaders. Uh, over here on the uh, top portion, uh, you know, one of the kind of uh, um, uh, saviors, right? I believe that's uh, supposed to be one of the, uh, the, uh, the members of the, you know, the royals. Uh, but as you can tell, like the fight and the battle is going on and on. And at the very end of the, um, of the wars on the right hand side, um, it is a uh, sort of a magazine slash newspaper depiction of the Italian officers signing the peace treaty with the Ethiopians, right? Um, and sort of coming uh, and bowing their heads and, you know, signing this defeat, uh, which this entire situation probably was completely against whatever they envisioned was going to happen. And so in... Uh, just to kind of put this into context once again uh, with the map, Ethiopia was standing independent over here on the right hand side. And so Ethiopia itself was independent um, on the eve of World War I. Uh, and so definitely uh, not a uh, pushover and was, you know, showing to be this enormous, uh, you know, this enormous rallying cry, right? towards uh, resistance, essentially. Now, let's look at the British model. And this will be the last model that we're going to look at before moving on to our 21st century um, snippet and look. And I chose to look at the British model um, once again, because it kind of rounds out the main players that we want to discuss. And I'm going to leave Egypt um, for our Middle Eastern sections because I want to um, put Nasser in there um, towards the tail end of uh, sort of uh, Islam and kind of moving into the uh, newer sort of Egyptian uh, modern revolutions that they had and the Arab Spring Revolt and all of those. And so the Brits, how did the Brits come into all of this, right? 
So initially, the Dutch were the ones that were uh, sailing around, and especially in South Africa, and this is going to be a viewpoint on South Africa, the Dutch were the ones from the Dutch East India Company, which was essentially this huge multinational corporation that was like almost a nation itself, and it was just powerful and rich and had its own military. Um, they ended up settling in South Africa, initially to establish bases for trade, right? Um, eventually, it was benefiting them to have some Dutch folks stay there, settle, farm. Eventually, they started to intermarry, having these uh, sort of half white, half South African children. Um, and the life started to kind of become a little more uh, domestic, right? Um, and so uh, eventually, we started getting this distinction between the Boers and the, um, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Kokwe. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. But, you yeah, know, we start to see the Dutch and the, uh, you know, farmers, right? Sort of the white farmers um, coming into play and settling down here in larger numbers. And we start to see the local South African tribes, right? Uh, you know, these kind of traditional nomadic, pastoral, agricultural people, right? So the natives, the locals. Um, and we start seeing this kind of differentiation between the two groups. But uh, the English come in, right? The Brits come in um, and starts to, uh, you know, form the Anglo-Zulu War. Um, and so known as the, uh, you know, also the, just the Zulu War. Six months um, and the Brits, uh, you know, essentially took over ownership of South Africa. And so they had three main parts um, or three main reasons uh, for their interest. Number one. They wanted for the Zulu population, the South African population, to provide labor for their diamond fields. Diamonds are forever, right? Um, it just reminds me of all of those commercials you see on TV. It's like, oh my God, he went to Jared. <laughs> uh, but yeah, diamonds are always in a, uh, demand, right? Um, number two, their plan to create a South Africa uh, federation in the region. Um, and so thereby destroying uh, a lot of the autonomy. And so they did want to create, you know, essentially a state, right? A subsidiary, as all of the uh, European imperial powers want to do. They want to create a substate for themselves um, that extends their own power, their own reach, and their own resource extraction capabilities. Uh, number three, the Boer or the, the white Dutch, white Anglo America, uh, Anglos, whatever, the farmers, uh, land claims. Um, they wanted uh, an additional spot for them to kind of filter in um, and have this territory where they can live and farm. And so uh, in this region, diamonds and gold were found, which obviously is going to just propel all of this situation. And so uh, slowly but surely, South Africa gets turned from an agricultural based economy towards an industrialized economy with the uh, sort of uh, British um, people uh, leading the helm. Um, and here's one example of the Anglo-Zulu War um, being fought, right, with the with the Brits and the military here, um, and another viewpoint and aspect, right, of the uh, the two groups going at it. Uh, but once again, um, just like in other parts of Africa, the uh, <clears throat> European industrial might was a little bit too much for the local tribes to handle as far as military tech uh, goes, and so um, as you know, as big and large and powerful and as skillful a warrior can be with a spear, an axe, a shield, etc. Right? You can kill 15 people with your bare hands. Um, two, three big bullets, and that's it. It's game over. Right? So it's a completely different um, method of warfare there. And so once the British become in control of the old Dutch colony. Um, they start to implement much more aggressive racial segregation. It used to be more informal, now it is becoming more formalized. And so it starts with, let's say, the South Africa Act in 09, um, where uh, the British Parliament essentially creates what is known as the Union of South Africa, right? Or just whatever South Africa politically is going to become. Um, having all of these various smaller regions just blobbed together into this one huge polity. And so 
the Brits are now focusing their attention on building up the country, building up the industries, the diamond, the gold mines, etc. And so uh, they are beginning to segregate the society. And under the High Commissioner, Lord Alfred Milner, he is the one that introduced the segregation policy, later known as apartheid. And so apartheid started um, in the mid-1900s and started to become this institutionalized racial segregation where you had whites and non-whites um, in separate areas of living quarters, separate public facilities, separate everything, very reminiscent and very similar to the American version of uh, segregation right, that we had in this country for decades. And so apartheid itself is the policy that governed South Africa's white minority and the non-white majority and was giving more rights and freedoms to the whites and less to the blacks. And so broadly speaking, there was like two types of apartheid. You don't have to get too much into it um, as far as the exam goes. Just know about apartheid in general. But they had like petty apartheid, which was uh, segregating and separating, let's say, public facilities, bathrooms, social events, restaurants, stuff like that. Uh, grand apartheid, which was uh, discriminating against housing and let's say job opportunities. Um, but regardless, just apartheid in general as an umbrella term, uh, it was you know definitely heavily segregated between the white and black populations for sure. Uh, we started getting the Mixed Marriages Act of 1949. Uh, it was an apartheid law um, prohibiting the marriage between Europeans and non-Europeans. Uh, I, oh, blast me. I completely forgot to put in this video. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in after the fact, after uh, I finish recording this lecture. It'll probably be in the next few slides or so or towards the end. But I'll put in a video of uh, Trevor Noah. I believe he was on a interview with Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report, the Colbert Show. And, uh, and he's, he's spoken about this often enough, uh, but I think that's the one I'm thinking of. And, you know, he just details uh, after he wrote a book, uh, something like Born, Born a Crime. I think that's what the book he published. And he was describing to Stephen Colbert that, you know, he was born during apartheid and his dad was a white Swiss. His mom was a South African black. And he was born a crime, right? He was not supposed to be born because of the Mixed Marriages Act and so forth. And so uh, it's it's a very interesting time, right, for for to, to have all these types of discussions. Um, and so I'll, I'll put that in later. So hopefully you enjoyed that video and Trevor Noah's sort of viewpoint and experience on the whole thing. Uh, we also have the Group Areas Act, right, forcing whites and blacks to live in completely different areas. Uh, and inevitably, the black areas were created into slums or called black spots um, on the sort of real estate maps that they would have going on. Thus, trying to create uh, a two, you know, two society system. Uh, and you have signs like this everywhere, right? Like, oh, whites only sign. Caution, beware of natives. Uh, whites here. Europeans here, non-black, non-Europeans uh, or blacks, right, going up these stairs, right? Everything started to get segregated and just divided. Uh, benches, Europeans only. So as you can tell, also these photos are just so reminiscent of the American, uh, you know, uh, uh, segregation years. Um, it's, you know, if I were not to, let's say, have put these photographs into the apartheid sections, right? Um, some of these photographs could... Uh, at times, if they say whites only or anything else, they could be kind of transplanted. Uh, you know, very, very eerily similar. And then uh, we do have a lot of uh, sort of police, uh, heavy policing, uh, heavy brutality in the forms of, let's say, the whites versus the uh, blacks during this apartheid, uh, you know, era. Uh, and so definitely uh, there are various discussions about people that, lived through these experiences like Trevor Noah, others, uh, Nelson Mandela, we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, and so, you know, it was pretty brutal, right? Because they were trying, as far as I could tell from all the readings and all of the interviews that I've uh, listened to over, uh, over all of this research, uh, 
everyone said the same thing that because the whites were a minority of the population but they were controlling things they tried to be as brutal and repressive as possible in order to maintain the status quo but eventually you just you see and you realize that you know you're not going to win here and so they they just essentially kept doubling down on the uh, brutality eventually though as we're going to see in a few slides with nelson mandela things started to change and so mandela was this great inspirational figure um, and is seen as his life being quintessentially tied to the issue of apartheid and independence so mandela himself was an anti-apartheid revolutionary he was a politician uh, philanthropist etc and he eventually served as president of south africa for a few years the he was the country's first black head of state their first elected official um, and so you know he had a very interesting history he was a political activist and going against uh, the status quo and he was speaking out so much that even though he um, he was married for three years to his lovely wife and they had a child uh, and he was a young man, uh, they threatened to put him in jail if he did not shut up. And so he chose not to be quiet and so they tossed him in jail. They kept giving him opportunities to say, publicly apologize and say apartheid is good. He kept saying no. And this fight went on for 27 years. So he spent the best years of his life, 27 years, away from his brand new, you know, three-year relationship with his wife, their, their three-year marriage, his child, right, that was just born. He spent 27 years away. Um, and eventually, right, his image was becoming so iconic amongst the people. Uh, his photographs, his writings, his um, interviews, everything. He started to grow in such a trend in South Africa that the people were demanding the release of Mandela. And so all of these events coincided eventually where the state of South Africa starts to, or the, the apartheid state starts to crumble we start to see the new formation of South Africa and kind of reborn into this new generation of getting rid of the racial segregation of apartheid. We start to see the rise of Mandela being elected as the first official, right, of this new South Africa and him being the perfect iconic embodiment of um, a man that was put in jail who did not uh, sort of waver on his convic uh, convictions um, and wanted to remain strong throughout the entire process. And so he was perhaps the perfect person to bring the country together at a time when over decades of you know misfortune, they were divided so heavily. Um, and so Nelson Mandela um, on the top right-hand side is a great uh, speech that he has, the inauguration speech. A little on the difficult side to understand because of his, uh, you know, heavier South African accent, but if you click the subtitles, um, they come ac across perfectly. Uh, and so he gives his inauguration speech and has various um, discussions and elements of bringing the nation together, right? Ending apartheid and segregation and moving forward into a better world. And for him saying, we are not going to hold animosity. We are not going to go on a vengeance rampage against the whites, so to speak. It is we are trying to heal the nation. Um, and an interview um, in the bottom right with Nelson Mandela and uh, CBS uh, News, where uh, he reflects on his time in prison because the interviewer asks him, you know, like, well, what was it like 27 years in prison? Uh, and he says it gives you so much time to think, reflect, and it solidified my ideology and convictions that they are correct and I need to keep fighting this oppressive system. Um, and he's like, he did say that it is unfortunate that I spent the best years of my life in prison, but at the same time, it does have his advantages because I was able to really mull over all of these issues. Um, and right when the country needed him the most, he stepped forward, right? And he tried to unify as much as possible. 
the last part part three Africa in the 21st century now this is a very difficult thing to to kind of summarize a little bit just because it's not a country it's a continent <laughs> you know it's it's there's just way too much history and there's way too much stuff going on but i tried to kind of encapsulate it a little bit as much as possible for like the main beats i guess so to speak um but it's just it's too much so we'll, we'll have a few slides for part three but you know we're almost at the end we're almost at the finish line folks don't worry uh i love showing this uh map just to show this the sheer size and scale of africa because usually on a world map africa is uh disproportionately uh sized because of the world map as how it's like created but Africa is actually like twice as large as what it's supposed to be. So you could fit the U all of these countries you could fit in into the exact same time. China, the US, India, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, some Western European countries. Madagascar is basically the size of the UK. It's enormous. And so uh, trying to fill in the sort of 21st century African history, it's just it's impossible. Uh, so I'm just doing some main beats here and there. So throughout the 21st century so far, the last 20 years or so, uh, we've had, you know, just a long, long list of military conflicts. Now, these there's so many countries and nations right encompassed in this entire continent. There are wars in between countries. There's civil wars here and there. Rebellions, crises. Uh, we have Islamic insurgencies here and there and some terrorist organizations coming up and up. But I thought it was uh, sort of important to highlight, especially for our later um, uh, Middle East sections, to kind of go towards the Islamic route. Um, and so like a very famous uh, sort of group that's that you'll hear on Fox News and all of the, uh, all of the other kind of uh, big um, newsreels, if uh, sort of African military sort of issues are coming up. Uh, during the last like two decades uh, is about Boko Haram an Islamic extremist group based in Nigeria and for the longest time have tried to overthrow the government and create an Islamic state and that's not uncommon um, just because many of the, uh, the worshippers of Islam believe that right just like their their heyday back in the day they need to consolidate they need to conquer and make a new Islamic caliphate uh, and so they're trying to have right uh, their heyday and of course have sharia law um, in place um, sharia law is the religious law um, that most uh, muslim countries uh, you know choose to adhere to which is based off of the quran their holy script right um, and the hadith and so uh, it's important to kind of and this is you know more in like the the northern part of africa for sure uh, but, you know, as far as military conflicts go, just like any continent, right, there's military engagements here and there, there's wars, there's conflicts, every single area of the world in the last 20 years has seen some type of like conflict one way or another. Uh, and so very complex. But in the last 20 years or so, of course, there's going to be some military issues here and there. Um, an important one um, that typically gets proliferated in the news are health concerns. So in Western media, typically, right, the, the narrative is, oh, well, Africa has ravages of HIV and AIDS and malaria and Ebola and tuberculosis. And it's not completely unwarranted, right? They have had these large epidemics before. Um, but if the only narrative that they have in the West and Western media is that all of the all of Africa can just be encompassed with they all have, quote unquote, they all have AIDS. That's not true, right? Uh, but it is a health issue that they have been dealing with in the last couple of decades because poverty and hunger and other issues, uh, lack of sex education or lack of, let's say, birth control or condoms and all of these different things, it leads towards uh, unprotected sex. It leads towards, um, m you know, many children, uh, which kind of lowers the chances of, let's say, higher um, income. Um, higher lifestyle, um, education, all these different various things. Um, but as far as health concerns, you know, it has been an issue that a lot of the um, countries and governments in Africa have been trying to combat. 
Uh, and once again, it's a large continent. So some countries have been much better at this than others. It just, it really depends. Um, and, you know, one shout out to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because with all of their billions, um, they have been going into Africa and pouring in large amounts of money to try to combat a lot of these issues and try to help and to try to um, uh, have, you know, vaccines against malaria and HIV and AIDS, um, provide education and schooling, uh, Google Chromebooks, establish classrooms, like all of these great things. Uh, and here's a video of uh, Bill and Melinda kind of discussing a lot of the issues that they've been seeing and what they think that the upcoming, uh, you know, number of years of Africa is going to look like. An interesting thing to note, which I did not really foresee. As I was going through this video, I was like, I looked at the like to dislike ratio and it was like heavily into the dislike. And I was like, why, why is it heavily into the dislike? So I started reading through the comments and um, it's so good to see. It's so good to see that it's not only an American thing where Americans are like, I'm not going to wear my mask. I don't want your vaccine. Right. And all these things It's the government trying to control me. Oh, there's just a legion of people commenting like, I don't want your vaccine. It's going to make me sterile. I want children and I don't want your vax, your Western vaccine. You're trying to kill the populations and try to do this now. Whether, you know, I, I'll chalk that up probably safely to conspiracy theories um, just because vaccines have, you know, proven to help with many of these issues. Um, and so, you know, it's I believe it's um, and we'll, we'll get into this conversation now, actually, but I believe it's an issue of westernization versus Africanism. Right. And this rise of sort of African nationalism that has. Um, been on the up and up in the last couple of decades for a good reason. But as all of this sort of Western intervention, Western colonialism, imperial uh, ambitions in Africa, right? The, 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 everybody remembers what has happened over the last couple of hundred years. So that's in everyone's background and, and everyone's subconscious. And so as soon as, let's say, Bill and Melinda start talking about, oh, we're going to come in and help with vaccines and this and this, there's, there, for, for some and for many, there's going to be a pushback against, let's say, having help from the West. Um, on the left hand side, um, we have a, uh, you know, sort of like a regular video uh, discussing, you know, how a lot of the um, African countries are saying big economic boons and gains um, and their GDP is growing larger than ever. And this is true. Uh, and the country, many of the countries are seeing, you know, huge uh, gains uh africa as a continent in whole uh is one of the fastest growing economies of the world and so they have a lot going for them as a continent vast with resources right just enormously rich their population is exploding right and it keeps getting higher and higher and so that could be more labor more people right kind of you know higher population for them um, and number three, economy is building, the cities are expanding, right? So there is development and right, it's getting larger and larger. And so the video on the right hand side is a perfect end towards it. And it's a great video um, that I found of this young lady, uh, Laika Wali. Um, and she essentially describes uh, these westernization practices and ideologies and why that's a dangerous thing or perhaps an unnecessary thing for Africans to uh, accept. Because she said, you know, and she used many different examples, but uh, one example in particular she used was, uh, you know, uh, one of the nations was, uh, one of the countries was having a difficult time of, let's say, uh, getting their food production up. And the sort of, you know, uh, International World Bank came in and said, we'll invest $100 million and fix the, the food situation. Uh, but they tried to put in a westernized model of farming. The local model of farming was far more successful, right? With the irrigation techniques they had and they knew the land and the soil, et cetera, et cetera. So she said, why are we accepting money um, and their version of what is better for our country and our continent when we know best for ourselves? 
And so she makes the good argument of we should not change ourselves with quote unquote westernization. Um, we should look at Western countries and the Western world and the models that they have, but we should adapt it and evolve it to suit us and our needs. Otherwise, we run the risk of them just controlling us like they used to. And so I th thought that was a great sort of end toward it. And so there's a good TED talk for you to listen to if you have like, t I believe it was like 10 minutes, uh, uh, 12, something like that. Uh, and so a great video to kind of round out the lecture a little bit. And so with that, we end the section. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Uh, grading is still ongoing. And I will try to get the uh, all the grading completed as fast as possible. Be mindful of quiz deadlines. Uh, final argumentative essay is due um, August 2nd. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind as well. But I just wanted to thank you all for uh, being here, listening to the lecture. It's a little bit on the late side. Um, had a lot of uh, uh, grading to do on my end. Uh, some family issues on my end as well um, that I've been going uh, going through and kind of needing to handle. So uh, my apologies for having the video up a little bit on the late side. I say a little bit with like a lot of leeway there. But uh, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Um, and I tried my best to consolidate all of it into a nice cohesive narrative. Um, and so we're going to go into this new coming week. And I'll try my very best just to get a lecture up early and running um, and so for us to kind of hit the ground rolling as soon as grading is done because once I have that burden off my back I can get right back into lecture prep as usual and kind of finish off the uh, semester which we are almost done with so three cheers for that uh, but thank you so much once again and I will see you for the next video thank you so much take care